Well, I'm joined from Brussels by Stephen Bullock, a former UK official in Brussels and whose job involved negotiating with the other member states. And also with me here is UKIP's Suzanne Evans. Very good evening to you both. Mm -hmm. uh, Stephen, can you perhaps just explain why you think we do need some kind of transition? Well, I think there are uh, two clear reasons why a transition is absolutely necessary. Um, I think the, the first reason is that there's simply no chance in the time available of a fully comprehensive free trade agreement uh, being, uh, being agreed. I think we we'll should be very grateful if uh, the divorce agreement uh, and some agreement on the future relationship, including possibly uh, a set of principles and uh, possibly a, a, a transition arrangement, if that's, what the, if that's what the UK wants, be agreed by the end of that time. I think there's no chance of getting the, the FTA. And also, I think that the, the level of complexity involved um, simply requires a, a much longer right. amount, amount longer. of Longer. You've just said longer. That was the word. How long? What do you think it needs to be? And does it have to have a final date before we go in? Or do you basically think it can be indefinite? Well, I, I, personally, I wouldn't mind if it was indefinite, but um, I think that the European Parliament has said that uh, very clearly that uh, it would want it to be, uh, that it would have wanted to have a, a clear end date and the, they wouldn't want it to be uh, some sort of ha halfway house permanently. So I don't think, I don't think that it's in the EU's interests uh, to, want that to, be, to want that to be permanent. With the ever-present threat that the UK then decides that it wants to end the arrangement or start a start a new arrangement, and then we have to go through a, a similar, if slightly less complex, process than the one we're going through now again. Mm. Okay, Suzanne Evans, do you seriously think we can get away without any transition? I mean, is that really possible? Well, this is what we were told. I mean, I, I, going back to the EU referendum campaign, I don't recall the word transition being used once. This is a ruse that has been brought in by the people that want us to stay in. Fascinated to hear Stephen there talking about, uh, you know, it's not in the EU's interest to keep the transition praise going forever. Well, of course it is. We're one of their major net contributors. We'll still be subject to all their laws. We'll still be subject to their, their migration controls. We won't have any freedom at all. The fact is, uh, the people of Britain know exactly what they voted for. They voted to take back control of our money, our laws and our borders. We're going and if to we leave. have a transition period, we're not going to be able to take back any of those for goodness only knows how long. We either leave on March the 29th, 2019, or we're held hostage to the EU for an indefinite but, period but, of time. And but, we can't allow that to happen. Well, sorry, why is it so binary? I mean, what is the hurry? Because it, it's quite possible. We won't be ready to leave then, but we will be ready to leave a year or 18 months well, or two years Well, we should later. be ready to leave and then. then. And you know, this is always UKIP's concern about the, the, going the Article 50 route. The Article 50 route lays out a two-year period. If it's not possible to do it in a two-year period, why did Article 50 say it should be possible to do it in a two-year period? The whole thing is an utter nonsense. It is clearly a ruse. As for this free trade agreement that is apparently going to take a huge length of time, well, actually, free trade agreements are struck around the world without uh, 28 countries having to agree uh, in, in, in a matter of months. Um, the only reason that we won't potentially be able to do a free trade agreement in the next two years is because the European Union is expressly forbidding us from starting those negotiations with uh, other countries now. So so it's a bit of a false argument. Stephen, one can't help but feel there is there something to be said that actually basically you do just want to delay Brexit or stop it altogether and hope that maybe after two years something else comes along and we never go through it. That is, isn't that deep down what you really are saying? Well, my personal views as a Remain voter um, are that uh, we should uh, scrap Brexit as we've discovered that it's uh, uh, unbelievably harmful, going to be unbelievably harmful to the UK. There was a uh, a landmark study done by the UK and a changing EU at King's College today uh, that was released today uh, that showed very clearly that uh, leaving without a deal would be absolutely catastrophic, particularly economically. Um, all economic predictions are that it'll be a catastrophe and that isn't what was promised by the Leave campaign. The Leave campaign promised that it would be excellent and that there would be lots of money flowing that we could use for lots of lovely things. Right. Um, yeah. And that's not, what's, that's not what's going to happen. The point is that there are a series of realities here such as uh, food standards, aviation safety, patents. Uh, we've seen it with Eurotom over isotopes yep. for medical treatments, mm -hmm. uh, the energy market. All this needs to have agreement. Reach okay, that's it. very helpful. Uh, so, but let's take those specifics and put them to Suzanne Evans. Mm -hmm. Let's take aviation. Mm -hmm. Michael O'Leary of Ryanair has said it. 
their timetables are coming out in a year's time. They need to know whether they're allowed to fly well, and it's know, not fixed up. I think if you ask Michael O'Leary, if you ask Stephen, uh, they say, well, how long would you like this transition period to last? They'd say, oh, well, forever, because they, they actually don't want to leave. They've got their own vested right. interests. So and what is, what is going to happen on aviation rights? If we, if we play hardball and say, well, we're not talking to you and we don't need to... Well, I don't, think we well, will be, I, I don't think you know, I don't think we will be playing hardball on aviation rights, will we? The, the no, on aviation rights, we'll be given. begging them to let us fly into their well, airports. Ex and exactly, <laughs> and it's actually the same with trade as well. Now, Stephen said that the economic case if we leave without a deal will be disastrous that's simply not true if we have tariffs uh, and, and we start trading under World Trade Organization terms that will actually bring an economic benefit to the EU of around 12.7 billion right, but, people have but, estimated but, but just what happens on aviation rights just suppose they say look we're waiting to have a proper negotiation here and and and, and, and we say no we're leaving we're leaving we're, we're, we're what happens well, when the planes are there's no treaty but governing that's not, the but that's, but that's not going to happen, is it? There are right. other international right. agreements Stephen, in any is case. it going to happen? Is it realistic that they'll planes actually say you can't grounded. have nuclear... You know, you can't have nuclear materials and you can't fly out of, of Heathrow Airport? Um, I think it's actually, it's actually slightly worse than the aviation market. Everyone talks about the aviation market. Um, I only found out recently that uh, aviation safety is currently done by uh, an, an EU agency, which is covered by the ECJ, as they all are. Um, and the UK doesn't have its own capacity for the certification of uh, the people who repair aeroplanes. Uh, and they have, what, at the moment, 19 months to establish a regulatory framework and to recruit and train people to be able to do that certification. And my point is that there are literally hundreds. It's a 40-year relationship. It's a complicated relationship. There are literally hundreds and hundreds of areas that keep cropping up. Every time I run into a sector expert in Brussels, he tells me about the difficulties that there's going to be in his, in his area. Uh, I'd never thought of the energy market, for example. I know that energy experts had thought about, uh, thought about Eurotom and isotopes. Um, I think food standards came up just the other day. And I, we're just going to see more and more of these moments that we, we simply didn't realise. You, know, you see Suzanne, Stephen, you we can't... We're going to have to find this capacity. Stephen, you can't see Suzanne is shrugging in a weary way as though she's heard it all well, before. Well, I'm sure she is because Suzanne hand, believes in Brexit at all costs. On the she first believes in Brexit hand, no, at any not, cost to the economy. Well, <laughs> This idea that there's this cliff edge, you know, you can talk about my hyperbole, you've just got your own as well. You know, the fact is, it, this, what Stephen's saying now, this just shows how deeply embedded we have got into the European Union. It's just any, how much any transition, of our sovereignty we've given away. This is what we have to get ourselves here, out of. Here's one serious one, is, is, is whether we've got time to build border posts and understand the customs infrastructure that will be coming in force the day we leave. Now... Do you accept even there we need some transitional implementation? No, I think we should be getting on and doing it now. And that's the, that's the issue, isn't it? About what we are allowed to do now. And this, I go back to, is always my concern about the Article 50 route. This slow-mo progress out that is actually designed not to allow countries to leave, but to keep them in. If we'd have repealed the 1972 Communities Act, European Communities Act, we could actually we could be unilaterally pretty much unilaterally out. out and uh, ultimately it would have been to our benefit. Suzanne Evans, Stephen Bullock, thank you both. Sorry, I've got to leave it there. Thanks ever so much, Stephen. Thanks, Stephen, in Brussels.